Okay, so I would like to uh, welcome everybody back for uh, this next session, uh, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, just as an introduction, my name is James Brady, and I am a research assistant here at the uh, Center for Science and Security Studies, and my focus is on proliferation of biomass, precise safe rate and use funds for illicit uh, nuclear weapons programs. Um, our session today is going to be touching on uh, themes of how we engage in risk assessment for novel technologies, the use of AI in surveillance technology, the promotion of peace and security, and AI in the peaceful use of nuclear technology. Um, I'm going to do a very brief introduction of our panelists before I hand over the floor. So, uh, Soren uh, Taylor is an independent multidisciplinary researcher and a student associate of Codewatch. Uh, and has previously studied at the University of Nottingham. Dekha Lu is a BA student in international studies at the University of Nottingham Ringbo campus. Uh, Sarah Weiler is a research fellow at the Global Policy Research Group, uh, working on AI governance. Um, we're also joined by Saida Batu, who is board chair for the Emerging Voices Network at ASIC and is a master's student in international relations at the Islam University. Um, so we have 10 minutes each. Uh, I will give you a wave at five minutes and then another wave again at nine minutes. So, and, a, um, and I'm looking forward to uh, hearing both uh, thoughts from our audience as well as any thoughts that you might have on the other presentations uh, for the next 40 to 50 minutes. So uh, I'm going to hand over the floor to Sorin if uh, you would like to you would like to lead our discussion with. Mm -hmm. So if this is a workable idea for one or more other panelists, I would like to address myself at the floor. I prefer not to go to the <laughs> okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm happy to be here, happy to see all of you. Um, I will talk about the use of AI-powered technologies in the UN's efforts to promote peace and security. Um, I will start with a little bit of background um, on where this presentation is coming from, and then I'll dive into discussing first um, the use of AI in the promotion of negative peace, and then positive peace, and then I will end with um, some short takeaways and what I think um, Follows from the investigation that I've been starting with production. I'm Sarah. Um, as um, you both said, I'm a research fellow with the Global Policy Research Group and have a background in social science with a very diverse interest in different topics. Um, most importantly, I've been doing an internship with the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs for the last three months. And during that internship, I was working on trying to collect an overview of activities at the UN related to AI and AI's implications um, for the UN um, generally, but today I will focus on the peace and security aspect. If you're interested in that, um, I think the slides might be shared with you anyway, so you can just access the link, otherwise you know and I can share the link with you. Yeah, so before I get into it, um, I We'll try to scope the, the presentation that I'm holding. My title includes lots of loaded terms, including artificial intelligence, which doesn't have a uniform definition and it's related to lots of different concepts and issues. The same holds for peace. Um, both of them, yeah, 
quite contested concepts. And then on top of that, you have the United Nations, which is a famously complicated and large bureaucratic body with lots of sub organizations um, and entities. Um, and I will not dive into definitions here. Um, for artificial intelligence, any any time that a UN actor says they are working on AI, I will consider that relevant um, for the presentation and um, for the project that I did. For peace, I will go with a, I think, relatively conventional um, definition of negative peace as anything related to the prevention of physical violence and conflict, and then positive peace as as trying to aim um, to, to create the conditions for lasting and peaceful or non-violent coexistence. Yeah, that's it. Um, I will um, jump into the, the output of my investigation that I did during the internship. Um, as relates to negative peace, there are a number of UN entities and bodies that do some relevant um, work on this. Um, and they do so in four main areas, according to my investigation. Big disclaimer here: um, I do not, I cannot guarantee that I, um, uh, I will present a comprehensive overview of any everything that is going on at the United Nations. I was doing the internship for three months. Until the last week, I kept finding new things that are happening. Um, so yeah, this is just uh, an outage. Um, and some people get you more curious and maybe give you a little bit of an overview, but not a huge just... So, yeah, the four areas in which the UN is working to promote negative peace. Um, first, um, they are engaged in the um, fight against the misuse of AI in military media. So, um, we've seen this in one other panel today where, um, yeah, where we had a presentation about. Um, uh, yeah, the, the UN's efforts uh, to, to research and raise awareness about AI's implications for the military realm, especially when it comes to um, nuclear weapons. Um, then a second area where the UN is active in trying to promote negative peace in relation to AI is in disarmament and um, arms control. We've all also heard a little bit about that already today. Um, AI can be used um, to assist verification and monitoring of weapons tests of um, nuclear facilities, nuclear civil nuclear energy facilities, which could be used um, to produce um, weapons grade material. Um, important to note here is that AI is still quite unreliable um, and possibly will remain unreliable to, ex to an extent that there will always be a need for lots of human oversight in this space. So you can use AI to detect anomalies that then somebody, a human, human a team of humans looks at more carefully. Um, yeah, but it, according to people working in this space, it is helping um, to increase efficiency and effectiveness of the um, Third area, quite a big area, is AI in peacekeeping and peace building. Um, the Department for Political and Peacekeeping Affairs is according to, to my investigations, um, quite active in this space, both in terms of research um, and stakeholder outreach, trying to um, think about and foresee uh, implications of AI for the future um, of peacekeeping. But then there are also efforts to use AI as a current stance to promote uh, peacekeeping and peacebuilding initiatives, um, both by using AI for simple data, simple or more complicated data analysis tasks, and then also an initiative which they call digital dialogues, where they use large language models um, to assist conversations with local populations um, who often don't speak the same language um, to bring them together to discuss in a, in a given situation what is needed for lasting peace. Um, so this helps um, increase local ownership. Okay, with that, I move on to the US promotion of positive peace. This will be somewhat shorter. Because basically everything the UN is doing can be related to peace in some way, um, which goes back to this um, peace humanitarian development triangle. Um, and it's also, I hope, illustrated by this, this figure of the Sustainable Development Goals, um, which shows that all of these Sustainable Development Goals all hang together and they all impact the, um, yeah, the sustainability and the, the lasting 
less of these building methods. Um, so we'll just give a few examples of what organizations across the UN are doing. So they are using predictive analytics um, to foresee where disaster might strike, and then better able to prepare for that and to respond quickly um, when it happens. Then machine learning tools are also used for situation awareness. In case disaster strikes, this can be extremely helpful to get a better idea of what is the situation on the ground, um, where is help needed, but also um, how can we best provide it. Um, then there is information management. Um, so this has grown a lot with large language models. Um, it's very experimental at the moment, um, but there are uh, there is, people are exploring the use of large language models to um, find information more quickly, um, analyze information, and then yeah, work more effectively and efficiently. And then lastly, one thing that I already I mentioned for the negative part, the UN is engaged in governance efforts and trying to um, promote the responsible use of, it, of AI, both inside the organization and also among states and among other actors. Last point, um, my main takeaway is that there is a cost, or at least for me, this investigation was a cost for hope, in the sense that across the UN, there are lots of teams and, and groups that are looking into the issue of AI and its implications. Um, they seem seem quite earnest and engaged in what they're doing. They don't, also don't seem clueless in what they're doing. Um, but at the same time, also see a huge call for action because the topic is blowing up at the moment. Um, it's their development around AI is super fast. There is a lot of hype. Um, so it's hard to really understand what does AI mean for the United Nations, but also to understand what is the United Nations doing? Is it effective? Um, are there duplicated efforts? Um, so as I said, throughout my internship, I kept encountering new things that were related to other things, but nobody seemed to know what the other group was doing. Um, so I think there's lots of room for further analysis of ongoing efforts um, to streamline the process to make it more effective. And I think um, building on that, um, there's a need for more people to, to look at the space, to do research on it on a, on a very basic level, Many of the things we've heard today would fall into that category, and I'm, I, was, I was happy to hear all of these um, research efforts. I also think um, there's need for responsible tech development, um, tools that are being produced, which can then be used by UN staff, and um, don't have the capacity to build it themselves. Um, I think there's, there's room for people who are interested in, in working at the UN. Um, yeah, so the need is for people who are both aware of the ethics um, related considerations that need to be taken into account if you need to use AI responsibly, but who also um, are willing to learn about the technological side of things to really understand what are these models and what do the ethical considerations um, imply in practice. I understand. Um, lastly, I think people outside the United Nations um, are also super important. So you don't have to go into the United Nations to contribute to the space. If it's, as I said before, um, super important for more people to look at what is the UN and different human actors, what are they doing, how well is it working, what should they be doing. And I think human actors, from what I've seen, at least some of them are very willing to listen to that kind of thing. Lastly, this is relevant in case you um, want to engage with the US efforts in the future. Again, happy to share the slides and you can just check the links. Yeah. And with that, uh, thanks for your attention. <laughs>
Yeah, and we can see your uh, we can see your PowerPoint as well. Okay, great. That's wonderful to hear. Um, hello. So, hello everyone. I'm the Kai Liu. And I come from the Ningbo campus of University of Nottingham. But yes, we do have a Ningbo campus. And it's in mainland China. We got a relatively liberal atmosphere, but not that great. But anyway, today I'll be presenting on my thoughts on the applicability of AI in surveillance and how it could create, make the big brother from 1984 come true. So I think we are all familiar with this scene from 1984 when we watched the movie or read the book. Right when Winston was doing his morning exercise, she was he was criticized by the women by not bending down low enough. Right, like this is a chilling implication of what Orwell thought the modern technology will bring to us. But Big Brother is not watching us, as we all know, and it's remain a work of fiction. So it's certainly not due not due to effort, lack of effort. People would many regimes would love to have this kind of surveillance, but why it has not come true. So there are three key ele elements that I identify. First, there needs to be the observer, the women. Second, there will be the tool, the telescreen. Third, there needs to be the observed, the Winston. Um, and really, none of these three has been placed before the internet. Um, <laughs> It's difficult for one person to monitor more than 100 person in real time, as we all know from lecturing students. So to monitor a nation of 1.4 billion, you need uh, 14 million people, which is inconceivable. And it's quite impossible to install a camera into every home. So it has remained but in 20th century, a technical impossibility for a big brother to emerge. But now, surely, you will say we are all being watched. Snowden's revelation has said, OK, US have access to almost all our internet activities. And we do have many internet activities. Uh, we use Facebook, we use Google, we use Twitter. We post what we see, and we read what is given to us. And, uh, we, and frankly, the NSA knows what we read and what we see. Um, I'm sure that um, something similar is still going on for all the intelligence agencies in the world. They would be able to have the technical ability to intercept to intercept um, our communication. Um, I, I don't think that's a secret or something that we that is challenged, and that's something that's not something new. The government can always request a warrant to search your home and everything. But still, this is fundamentally different from 1984 because of two points. First, the observers are still human, and there's so, only so much a human can do. And there's only so many people at NSA and FBI and CIA and so on. So their ability, their, the number of people they can effectively and personally monitor is very limited compared to the world population. And second, observed still retain autonomy. Uh, people could choose to refrain from using, for example, Facebook. And it is possible to use alternative chat that is secured against NSA surveillance, at least in theory. So we here, we only have the two that are sophisticated, but other three, two parts are still lacking. Um, so uh, Foucault have a theory that does acknowledge these two parts. First, the observer's ability is limited, and observed to have autonomy. His theory is that if the people who are observed believe they may be watched, not that they are watched, they will behave as if they are watched and would rationally engage in self-censorship. So with that, with this circular prison, they could effectively fulfill observer's intention of making sure every people behave without having to invest into the resources to monitor every single one individual. But this is based on the assumption that previously mentioned that it is logistically and technically impossible to monitor everyone. But that's not true anymore. So there's a study from um, uh, Switzerland that I have summarized here. 
So artificial intelligence now can empower the observer. So um, you can take a read at the slide, but I will just summarize it. Basically, if you run someone's Reddit post history through a language model, it will be able to infer basic attributes of that person. And it done with very high accuracy. I'm not sure about the resolution here, but this is the sample from the paper that I copied. And so basically by AI, by looking at a particular wording, like a hook term, it could infer that the user is from Melbourne, from Australia, because it's the term you really used in Australia. Like, of course, a human from Australia will be able to do that, but certainly not someone from, I don't know, Russia or Iran, it'd be very difficult for them to make this kind of assumption, in, infer, inference from the user post. But AI now can do that. And the author also tried various mitigation methods like anonymization and model alignment, but they all fail. Why? Because to understand a user's input, it has to understand the nuances of languages. And quite honestly, this is denied from their perspective. Like if you put something into uh, AI and ask it to understand it, surely AI should be able to do that. But if you do it um, from a political point, there might be considerations, but not for democ democracies. Because democracies, do, do not, if they have this kind of uh, access, they are not, it's not very useful to them. They don't have any use for this kind of inferred data. Okay, if she's from Australia, she's doing being a, a cleaner, maybe she hates the Australian government, but let's use this for most for national security purpose, but not for authoritarian regimes. I'm sure you know which one I'm referring to, but I cannot mention it uh, due to some consideration. So um, Western software, they use encryption and there are legal challenges for them to, for government to access user data. But in China, there's legislation that mandates access for government to user data. So um, in China, the most popular chatting software is WeChat. And it's, it's has been commonly reported that government has access to all your chat history. So the old way to surveil someone is to either send an agent, costly, and only you only have so many agents, and you can be, it, the agent can be discovered, or could use informats, which also costly and could be false, use CCTV, but you need to have CCTV in the first place. So these are all very heavy investments. You need to know who you are surveilled, surveilling to surveil them. But now people actively share their most sensitive information on the internet. And even if they don't, their friends will do. Uh, for example, take the example of our university. Uh, there's a professor who like to talk about certain incident on in June. Mm, he doesn't use phone, for example, let's assume that. And it's be very difficult for government to use any of these methods to monitor him, it's impossible. Uh, but if the student, after finishing their lecture, they share this information that the professor talked about certain topics on WeChat, and the WeChat history is run through a language model, the government can know that, okay, there's a guy, he talked about this, he, he thinks this about that, and it's all neatly summarized by the student, by the person. So everyone become an informant unwillingly, or willingly or unwillingly, because there's no alternative. Alternative channels are blocked. So what are the consequences? I'll make it quick. So first thing, governance capacity is something that is growing. Um, they can't be able to be imported, but now it can, because you hear how Huawei is exporting surveillance technology, like video camera. But you can also export this and be very effective at crushing any sign of dissidents, because dissidents use digital technology to communicate. It can crush, they can, system can identify them and locate leader and locate locations and how the government agency to pair in advance. So it's very, it's very powerful. And for the private sector, uh, now it's important to consider the consequences. So this is a very denied civilian tool to understand text. But now, as I just said, it can have very powerful national security consideration. 
So should we just treat states as sovereign, or should we um, consider should we consider the implication of our technology we are offering to society? The models that we open source may be actually empowering bad actors. But are, if state actors become bad actors, should are they sovereign? Should we have any right to interfere in what they do? This is a question that I'm still trying to find an answer. So here are our three takeaways from my presentation. And I hope you could uh, find my presentation informative. And I look forward to your questions later. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sekai, for a really interesting presentation about um, surveillance technology. Uh, I'm going to turn next to um, uh, Saida. Uh, and, uh, you're online, Saida, and you're there. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Uh, um, just give me just give me a minute to share the screen. Sure, of course. Uh, take your time. <laughs> And I'd encourage everybody, if you have questions or if you have thoughts or comments, uh, uh, please just take a note and we'll turn to them shortly uh, after Saeed and Swan's presentation. Uh, can so you see my slides? We're able, to see your, uh, we're able to see your slide and we're sharing it now. We can see your slides. We can hear you clearly. Please go ahead. The floor is yours. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I am sorry for how I sound. I am a little under the weather. I am Saeeda Sababatu. I chair the board of Emerging Voices Network and it is really nice to see Evian team and all of you here. So I am also pursuing my MPhil degree in international relations from Qaeda Azam University, Islamabad, Pakistan. Now I will be talking on AI for peaceful applications of nuclear energy and its future prospects. So firstly, what is AI? As everyone has explained it in detail, I'll just briefly touch it. AI refers to simulation of human intelligence processes by machines, particularly computer systems. Specific applications of AI include expert systems, natural language processing, speech recognition, and machine vision. AI programming focuses on cognitive skills, including learning, reasoning, self-correction, and creativity. AI, machine learning, and deep learning are often used interchangeably, but distinct, dis distinctions exist. AI was coined in 1950s and it simulates human intelligence encompassing evolving capabilities with new technologies. Machine learning enables softwares to predict outcomes accurately using historical data, while deep learning is inspired by the brain's structure, advancing AI in various applications. So now let's briefly dig into what are the peaceful uses of nuclear energy. Some of you might be already familiar with this, but peaceful uses of nuclear energy are indispensable for human advancements and welfare. Article four of the NPT recognizes every state's right to peaceful nuclear energy. Peaceful applications contribute to medicine, public health, agriculture, food security, water resources, sustainable energy, and the environment. So now the question arises that why should we focus on nuclear energy? Nuclear energy plays a very vital role in achieving sustainable development goals as uh, nuclear energy power plants emit almost zero GHG emissions, greenhouse uh, gas emissions. Nuclear energy is crucial for achieving global net zero objectives, complementing renewable sources in a sustainable energy system. It ensures 24 seven energy supply reliability, addresses climate objectives, and requires around 550 gigawatt, gigawatt of new nuclear cap capacity by 2050. Now, AI technologies definitely assist peaceful nuclear applications in human health, agriculture, and environmental management. It aids disease diagnosis and treatments, enhances food systems, sustainability, and supports water and environmental studies. AI accelerates fundamental research in nuclear science and plays a vital role in fusion research. Water and environmental studies. I see that the line has dropped on our side. Nuclear science. 
Science and Fusion Research Benefits. Just for one second, Sorry. Um, as we wait for the connection to return. Sorry, the line has dropped. So if you could just repeat the previous slide previously. If you could just uh, could resume on this okay. point. Okay, this one. Right. Okay. I was saying that AI technology is definitely assist peaceful nuclear applications in human health, agriculture, and environmental management. It aids disease diagnosis and treatment, enhances food system sustainability, and supports water and environmental studies. AI its fundamental insights plays a vital role in fusion research. Water and environmental studies. nuclear science and experimentation. Combining digital simulation with AI optimizes nuclear power operations, improving reactor designs, performance, and safety. Machine learning automates tasks, enhancing reliability and error prevention. AI contributes to nuclear security and radiation protection by enhancing detection systems, analyzing data, and reinforcing safety standards. Now, here's something interesting about the labor work at the nuclear facility, especially near the nuclear fuel pool. When labor, uh, when the labor is inspecting the fuel pool, they have to bend to look down inside the pool, as you can imagine a person looking down a well. So there has been a few cases report, reportedly in which some guys fell into the fuel pool. So uh, luckily, it did not kill them, but definitely nobody wants to fall into a nuclear fuel pool. Obviously, They're, they got cleaned by whatever process they follow. But now, to avoid such cases, AI robots are being used by a few facilities, replacing human labor around dangerous zones in inspecting nuclear fuel pools, ensuring safety. Moreover, talking about safety, AI robots are being increasingly used in nuclear facilities for tasks like locating and handling nuclear material. These robots are equipped with advanced technologies such as 3D modeling, virtual reality, uh, and drones, and they help in efficient data collection, enhance safety, and reduce costs during decommissioning activities. Now, countries including Japan are employing innovative robotic technology for tasks like re retrieving, disposing uh, of fuel debris. The use of AI robots robots is a high-tech solution that contributes to effective project implementation and risk reduction in nuclear decommissioning. Safeguards rely on AI for analyzing data obtained through various means, including satellite imagery, environmental sampling, and video surveillance, providing credible assurance of peaceful nuclear material use. Moreover, AI poten AI's potential applications in nuclear material production include anomaly detection for monitoring machine problems and cybersecurity defense. It en enhances safety and efficiency in critical equipment and processes. Now, the automated optimization trains AI algorithms to analyze industrial processes, predicts uh, product quality, and corrects parameter for optimized solutions. Automated discovery remains in early developed stages for nuclear material production. Now, talking about the IAEA, the IAEA fosters collaboration on AI's use in nuclear applications through interdisciplinary fora and the AI for Atoms platform. AI holds potential for enhancing efficiency, safety, and predictive ma maintenance in nuclear energy production. Now, talking about the future, governments should be in charge of overseeing data and infrastructures related to nuclear material production, adapting existing, existing rules for new technologies like AI, it's essential to focus on regulating the transfer of sensitive data and advanced information infrastructure associated with AI in nuclear material production. To bridge the gap between the nuclear sector and AI experts, there should be a three-step approach. Understanding AI role, AI's role in nuclear uh, production, involving AI industries in policy discussions, and establishing adv advisory boards. This can enhance knowledge exchange and contribute to effective export control guidelines. Now, encouraging ethical AI is the nuclear industry in the nuclear industry by emphasizing compliance with guidelines and regulations can also help in advancing the use of AI for nuclear security, nuclear energy. Civil society plays a vital role 
as watchdogs exposing risks associated with AI nuclear material processing. Companies aligning with UN SDGs can be influence, influential and civil society's effort, efforts can create grassroots initiatives for re responsible AI practices in the industry. Also, another recommendation for the IAEA funded projects is to replace human labor working in dangerous environmental zones with AI generated robots and technologies to reduce the cost of the labor, considering that the IAE budget has not been increasing, but is still the same, while the number of IAE funded projects are increasing by the day. So in conclusion, the in integration of AI in nuclear energy holds immense potential for enhancing efficiency, safety, sustainability, while fostering global collaboration and adherence to ethical standards, thus paving way for a brighter future and peaceful nuclear operations. Thank you. Thank you so much. And our uh, final speaker for today is Soren Feder. So, Soren, I'll hand over to you. Uh, and you. Thank you. Um, may I open my laptop for the slides? Uh, Back to the back before the panel. Are you, are you on? Uh, I'd like to want... just put my slides. Okay, but are you on Zoom? Oh, I'm not on Zoom. Yeah. I don't have Wi-Fi here. Okay, so okay. have you got your slides? Um, yeah, you know, maybe, you it. maybe it's better if I just speak, then I can share the slides after. Yeah, okay. that's fine. Uh, okay. Um, so, hello, everyone. Um, I'll just use my slides as a sort of index card system. Uh, this is not going to be comprehensive. Uh, I used to work <laughs> and research more narrowly within the existing modes of uh, civil society participation, second draft diplomacy, scientific research, all of that. And then it kind of hit me what it actually means to be a Canadian. And that changed pretty much every aspect of my life. And so my talk is mostly just intended to be um, a discussion, hopefully, and uh, an international perspective. Uh, I'm, like I'm a European who lives in a settler colony and uh, so my talk is not going to be about AI at all, really, but <laughs> I hope you'll forgive me and I do hope that you get some good uh, insights from this. Uh, yeah, what did I write here? Could you talk a little louder, please? Certainly, yeah. Okay, so my talk is called An Argument Against Shallow Risk Assessments from Mental Health to International Security. And I'd like to specifically thank the Canadian Pugwash Group who sponsored my attendance here. Um, okay, so quickly, I just want to, you don't know me yet, but um, if it's okay, I just want to do a quick survey popcorn questionnaire. When I say Canada, um, if you're comfortable just sharing any words that come to mind, any associations with that word, with that noun. Ice hockey. Ice hockey? No. Yeah. No. <laughs> Sir? No. Snow? Maple syrup. Well, less so these days, but yeah, maple syrup. Thanks. <laughs> they're all fakes. <laughs> they call them, they're all fakes. I think we, we might mean different things by that. But <laughs> part. Um, when I think of Canada, I uh, I think of an organization that uh, has not partnered with me. Um, I think the role of a government is to partner with the, their populace. And that's not my reality. So I wish I had better news, but it is going to be all doom and gloom for the next approximately nine minutes. And uh, <laughs> my, my aim is to present that cynicism to you in a way that kind of harmonizes like any frameworks that you might be bringing. Because uh, one picture that I had on my slides was so this. Right. So, this is a photo of me. Uh, my mom gave me this blanket. Is that a familiar symbol here? The Hudson's Bay Company blankets? No. Okay. So, um, these, these blankets, the Hudson's Bay Company is our most popular uh, retailer department store. And uh, yeah, these blankets have a long history, both in Canadian and in Métis uh, history. So, the Métis are people, for those unfamiliar, living around the Red River in, in the prairies. And uh, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but the 
uh, like Anglophone Canada, British Canada has uh, really betrayed them. And so this, but more broadly, this blanket is a symbol of, actually, I don't know what the Hudson's Bay Company thinks it's a symbol of. To me, I think it, like I read it as a symbol of Canadian pride, sort of like you buy a jacket that looks like this if you want to represent the fact that you, you know, are Canadian and you like the aesthetic of that and you, you know, have maple syrup and play hockey and all of that. But, um, you know, we have to read proto-Canadian history starting from the early modern period. And so these blankets have been on Turtle Island for quite a long time. And uh, this is me just, this is a rail railway blockade. Um, definitely not like legal under the settler law. Definitely, we were surveilled very heavily. Um, this was during a period of uh, heightened diplomatic racism towards the Wet'suwet'en people out west on the Salish coast. And uh, Toronto's got a strong organizing community. So uh, this, this photo was in the Toronto Star. Um, and yeah, it's just my way of saying that like my generation is auditing some of the contracts that um, we've inherited that kind of work uh, it is work it, it's made to be very hazardous um and so uh, i would like to talk about some of the structural barriers to the equitable production of science and of knowledge about policy and governance because um yeah when we when we talk about systemic exclusion, um, that has effects that cascade for forever. Um, every time someone is killed, every time a family is killed, that changes the arc of history, and all the more so when we have programs of massive, especially state-sponsored violence, uh, and also the allocation of resources, whether in terms of like how a government creates the economic parameters for its citizens to subsist and work and, and all of that. Um, but also in terms of like what, like how research budgets are allocated, all of those things change the shape of our common future. Um, but, okay. So, um, um, I want to echo the, the chilling effects I was going to sketch a case study about um, uh, indigenous-led direct action. So I showed you this photo and it's like kind of cute, kind of like cosplay, like I did a thing, like I, you know, I guess technically this would be considered like an anarchist action. Um, but, you know, th that is also a form of extractivism where like settlers such as myself will, um, you know, try to partner with the movement for Black Lives, with Indigenous sovereignty movements, um, but also like having like being party to or heir to any program of mass violence is also like that comes with its own psychology. And so I think a lot of the policy that that we see deployed in research and um, yeah, it, it just it, it encodes. I think we're all traumatized. Um, I don't know what it was like before the 20th century, but um, yeah. The, the chilling effect has not been recognized by Canadian court. This has been litigated. Um, I, I just ended a term with a uh, legal publisher working with them and the courts out West, they, they just kind of say, oh, it's not a thing. But uh, like my mom is disabled, my grandma's disabled and I've seen their experiences with healthcare and I've seen the ways that um, self-diagnosis and self-disclosure are not taken seriously. And really it's a, it's a failure of listening. And I, hadn't, I don't think I have time to actually get to this point, but I had intended to kind of synthesize all these threads by arguing that um, sometimes when people like professional diplomats nowadays do not always earn like structurally they're really limited because they can only talk to other people who are in the club. And I used to love the club. I was a UN uh, youth representative about 10 years ago. I also was a youth blogger with the uh, Department of Public Information, NGO, Echelon. And uh, then I just like talked to more Torontonians 
Um, I happen to live in a city that I think is from what I've heard about Beirut of a certain era, I think it's got a similar vibe. Um, you just you meet a lot of people who know a lot of really wise things about the world. And now I think about institutional betrayal. Um, I think about segregated life expectancies for people I love, like my brother is native. And I wasn't planning to cry about this, but like I also don't think that that's separate from the analysis. Um, so yeah, I was I was also going to talk about some some things about like parallel economies and deprofessionalization. Um, so a good friend of mine is a birth worker, and uh, like if you're black and you're giving birth in Canada, you're not like it's not a safe situation. And so my friend works as a doula, and um, I just I live in a state of fear because I see how pervasive it is that people who endeavor to set up systems of safety, care, service provision, and diplomacy are being assassinated and poisoned. And we can talk about policing. Um, we can talk about I had this whole thing. I had a good fun for you to talk about photography and the history of representation and all this stuff. Um, but I think I'm going to just close by letting you know that uh, on Saturday, I'm hosting a Zoom workshop about um, like how language encodes norms and propagates history. I tried to prepare way too much material for this talk, and I actually have a sonnet for you. It's a Shakespeare sonnet, but still. Um, and I, I read that sort of as like a, an indicator, because it's, yeah, just, we don't, when we hold knowledge, that doesn't necessarily mean that we have reached the heart of the matter. And um, so what is my closing sentence going to be? <laughs> I'm afraid for my friends. That's my closing sentence, and I, I have hope that um, with enough political imagination, um, reckoning with our own egos and uh, vulnerability in experimentation, we can we can arrive at a world where that we that kind of corporate like second personal first personal plural is not used only as a coercive device, but is meaningful. Um, and I'll close with a quote from the Gulag Archipelago, which goes, well, let us go a little deeper. We have done far too much damage by looking at people as entries in a table. Whether we like it or not, the future will force us to reflect on the reasons for their behavior. Thanks. <laughs>
but there is this um, idea that you have security, safety, uh, safeguards by obsolescence somehow, because it's so old that people actually don't have the technology anymore to attack you somehow. So uh, I would like to know your perspective on that aspect, and if need be, can someone actually repeat into the chat or something? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so, Saida, did that question come through for you? <clears throat> Uh, I'm so sorry, but I wasn't able to hear it properly. Can somebody type it in the chat uh, box? Uh, then I can answer. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Uh, I might try and repeat it. So, uh, 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 I'm you... actually I'm actually having trouble listening to the audio because of internet connection. Can you just uh, type it in the chat box? I can reply. Okay. Tim, um, if you'd be able to share that question. Yeah. Um, you want me to type it? Yeah, if you could type it. Um, I have a question. If we have any other questions, if there's any other questions, we have questions on chat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if we can sort of a question from the chat, that would be great. So, um, Julia asks, I believe it's this session, is there a possible way to contribute in the, to the challenge of the lack of regulation amongst the public, or is this only a sphere in which states persons can act? So, I guess it's the question of who has the power to change policy. Um, is it Maybe elite actors, or is it the general population through advocacy or activism? So, uh, Soren or Sarah, if, if you'd like to take that question. Um, so, the question is, is kind of like the elite, uh, like grassroots distinction. Okay. Um, so, my friend works as a professor, and uh, she said that. Well, I mean, COVID happened, right? Still happening. And I think a lot of academics have been feeling the strain of this ongoing event on our, our like typical operation. And my friend said that um, there's one administrator at her college who is kind of just making a lot of busy work. And uh, my friend hypothesizes that this is so that the, the kind of higher up uh, department administrators can can justify their own salaries. Um, so I distrust that partition because I know how many good people are doing good work um, like outside of the system. Uh, but I also think that um, it, it's something extraordinarily special and valuable that we do have these like organized modes of inquiry and system building and all of this. Um, th the problem is just when when a system of of candid apartheid is written into those institutions, and there's a refusal to engage meaningfully with with people who are bringing credible uh, assessments of risk. Uh, like climate risk, for instance, that's what, what I was trying to talk about. I'm really scared about uh, the harms that will foreseeably come from and are already coming from uh, like ecological disequilibrium that arises because of uh, industrialization. And the elite people who are doing that work in indigenous communities have been blowing that whistle for, as far as I'm aware, 400 years literally 400 years and in, in my case the canadian journalistic apparatus was just racist and said you don't know that you couldn't possibly but it's like no like coast salish people actually predicted climate change because indigenous ecologists are scientists full stop so when i think about elites i don't necessarily think about credentials um and i, I respect and value the institutions that we have and I also fear them. And I think that um, a, a certain measure of humanitarian radicalism is necessary by way of triage. Um, because sometimes when people aim to take measures to kind of promote the health of, if you want, the, the global body politic, they do so more in the sense that Shakespeare says in The Tempest, um, most chirurgically. So kind of like a hack doctor with some very sharp scalpels. Um, when I hear the word elite, it includes positive things and it also includes that kind of conduct. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't, I can't give you any expert view, but I have an opinion on the input of uh, the public on the regulate on regulation. I think there are two ways in which it seems to me that the public is quite influential on, especially AI regulation as it happens today. The first is that members from the public, including academics, um, people in civil society organizations, etc., provide ideas and frameworks for thinking about the topic and for highlighting which issues are being um, addressed in regulations and which maybe are less so. Um, this is just my impression from being at the UN and also at the European Commission before that. Um, the policymakers or civil servants who write guidelines and regulations very often rely on this kind of knowledge that is somehow out there in the public sphere. So that seems like one path to, to impact for the public. And then the second is the classic advocacy and pressure. Uh, many regulators or somewhere in the chain of decision making, uh, people care quite a lot about the, um, the way that their regulations will be perceived in the public and whether this is popular or not. Um, and advocacy can, um, I believe, have quite an impact on whether different AI regulations are considered desirable or less so. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, there was a question there in the chat as well for Saida about um, obsolescence in nuclear te oh, not technology. So if you would like to take that question, uh, or if you'd like to contribute to that question on uh, uh, power and the power dynamics involved in uh, AI. So up to you, whichever question you would like to take first. Yeah, yeah I, I, I want to answer that because uh, I think that um, AI is a very high tech um, system. And uh, there are obviously vulnerabilities, and that is why the NPPs and the states and the you know uh, the safe safeguard systems are reluctant to incorporate it just directly. But it will be possible with time, I believe that, because uh, we have SMRs, we have not implemented SMRs completely till now, uh, because of the safety and security reasons. So yeah, obviously with technology uh, vulnerabilities come. Yep, that's my take. Thank you. Um, okay, um, I realize we're short on time as well, so we've got another panel ahead of us. So I'm going to uh, Tim. Unless you, anyone else has a yeah, question, so Dekai. Okay, yeah, please. Dekai, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can, perfectly. I just had a question because I think it'd be good if you had a question. So I really enjoyed your presentation. I was just wondering, I was thinking when you're talking about um, flipping the coin and just the other side of the coin, which is you talked a lot about um, everyone being an informant, but can everyone also use the power of AI to hold the government to account? So when I was thinking about GameStop and the GameStop phenomenon where everyone kind of jumped onto the bandwagon and um, increased the price of the shares rather when it was being attacked by investors. So I'm wondering, just as AI can be used en masse by the public to inform on each other in an East German style arrangement, which is a dystopian, can it go the other way and it be used to hold the powerful to account as well if we have these tools in our pockets? Yes, definitely. That's certainly a possibility. I think AI could have a really helpful uh, application in transparent government, in democratic regime. For example, the U.S. spending bill was like 500 pages long and full of legal jargons, and it would be impossible for average person to understand it. And But the AI could be used uh, to understand these kind of legislation in a short time to make sure that public understand what's going on. And even like simpler, like you could use AI to see your local council's, I don't know, annual statement and to see where your budget is going. And these kind of top tools used to require expert, but now you can use AI to hold it by, into account. But, um, but that requires a very high level of transparency and like accurate accounting and basically you need to government needs to be truthful for AI to be useful. That's why I was like focusing on negative aspect because people are truthful in their private conversation, not, well, not, not necessarily in their public statements. And people are in a very much disadvantaged position when uh, accessing private information from the government because that's, um, you, there's the power imbalance inherent here. So. I mean, you do have the freedom of information access request, but that's still being handled by humans and that doesn't scale. So 
I think that's certainly possible, but it would require government to open up their ac data access to public. And that was something people in electoral democracy should be actively demanding. But also that comes with this issue with exploitation by foreign intelligence, but that everything has its pro and coins, I guess. Thank you for your question. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, so in the uh, interest of smooth running and uh, efficient uh, agenda management, uh, I'm going to call a close to this session. Uh, we're, I think we have a 10-minute uh, break schedule. So we have a 10-minute break schedule. So get a drink of water, um, have a breath fresh air if you can, but 10 minutes. We'll be back in this room at 4.42 for the final closing session of uh, today's event. So uh, Soren Taylor, Sarah Weiler, Dekai Lu and Saida Batul, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation.